here. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Kubernetes RBAC 101. I'm Christy Tan, Marketing Communications Manager at CNCF. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Oleg Chinkin, CTO at Kubler. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenter. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF page at cncf.io slash webinars. With that, I'll hand it over to Oleg to get started on today's presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about Kubernetes RBAC today. And uh, so why I am talking today about that. And uh, um, I'm a CTO of Kubler and Kubler is a company who builds a Kubernetes enterprise Kubernetes management product um, called Kubler. Uh, so uh, intended to uh, essentially bridge the gap between uh, enterprises and uh, cloud native technology stack uh, to make sure that this uh, historically natively open uh, set of technologies relying on open technologies can work in uh, with uh, uh, within more restricted uh, again historically uh, sometimes more limited enterprise environments and bringing uh, the product which caters both to developers and operations teams within an enterprise. And uh, so that involves uh, essentially providing a centralized Kubernetes management panel at uh, plane and uh, centralized monitoring, logging, various security and governance requirements. And uh, on our, uh, so through our history uh, of developing this product, what we found is that uh, in many companies, <clears throat> well, having a reliable enterprise uh, Kubernetes management product is uh, just half of uh, the way, if, if not a smaller part. Um, many companies, after they start working with Kubernetes, also struggle with uh, um, defining new practices around uh, this new technology stack, uh, adjusting their practices and processes to uh, the technology and uh, learning essentially how to manage um, um, how to manage uh, this new modern applications uh, within their uh, policies and uh, requirements. So uh, and so what we found is that uh, RBAC is one of the areas which 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 causes uh, some confusion. So not that it's so much com complicated, but uh, people look for guidance on where to start, uh, what's available in terms of capabilities, and how these capabilities can be used in the real world. <clears throat> so, and uh, so hey, Alex, another, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Sure. Sorry to interrupt you. Could you just speak a little bit louder? Some folks are having a hard time hearing you. Okay, I'll try. Uh, so okay, is it better? thank you. Is it better? Yes. Okay, great. that's great. Thank you. So what uh, we'll do uh, today? So we'll essentially uh, go through uh, uh, all capabilities of Kubernetes RBAC, focusing on uh, the ones that are probably most uh, useful uh, from. Um, practical standpoint and uh, that includes uh, uh, what uh, our bug is uh, uh, various ways to authenticate uh, a user within a kubernetes clusters and several uh, different methods kubernetes can use to authorize different actions within kubernetes clusters uh, of which uh, our bug is probably the main one uh, so we'll, uh, you'll see that we'll spend probably a uh, bigger part of our time on authentication uh, um, op 
options, a uh, little bit less time on actually air bug management because surprisingly it's 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 a, a simpler topic, and we'll talk about a couple of practical use cases and how we can start managing our bug in Kubernetes clusters. So our bug. Essentially, our bug or uh, access control within the Kubernetes cluster is a, a way to define uh, either through extensions or declaratively. Uh, so which users can do what uh, with which objects. So for many of you who are familiar with uh, Kubernetes, so uh, you uh, understand uh, that there are different resources and subjects. Uh, so for those of you who are not, I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick introduction. So essentially Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform, uh, a tool which uh, on the high level from the outside gives you a single uh, API endpoint through which you can manage your containers across multiple uh, distributed uh, physical or virtual nodes. Uh, virtual machines, physical machines, et cetera, et cetera. So that API is uh, uh, follows uh, standard REST conventions. Uh, so everything you manage within Kubernetes is managed as a number of resources, objects that exist inside of Kubernetes uh, master server and that are available to you through API objects like pods, nodes, config maps, secrets, deployments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so hey, I Alec, just, sure. I'm so sorry to interrupt you again. I think your slide deck might be frozen. We're just seeing the first uh, title slide right now. Okay, uh, that might be the case. So yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. I, 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 yeah, I apologize. So uh, <laughs> it looks like it was uh, really uh, paused. So yeah, uh, just quickly scan through the slides I talked about. So here sure, have, no problem. Uh, and enterprise uh, requirements uh, that we identify as ones people uh, follow in, uh, in in larger companies. Kubler high level structures. I mentioned what Kubler does, uh, and uh, agenda of this demo. So I talked about that a minute ago. So and now we are on this slide um, talking about uh, how API of Kubernetes is structured and what are objects and various operations on those objects. Um, so as it is a standard REST API, so you have resources like pods, nodes, config maps, uh, various operations on those resources, uh, which, well, uh, are uh, expressed in form of HTTP verbs uh, that you send to the API. Uh, but when Kubernetes maps them onto actions uh, on those resources, they sometimes uh, may map into a little bit wider set of operations. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll have a slide talking about that. So, and uh, then there are actors, so subjects, uh, objects uh, that uh, represent for Kubernetes um, uh, credentials uh, of um, processes uh, who or which uh, work with various uh, Kubernetes uh, objects. And those fall into three categories. Those are users, groups, and service accounts. Uh, while uh, only service account actually exists uh, within a Kubernetes cluster, um, um, within a Kubernetes cluster API as an object, users and uh, groups um, and a, a sort of virtual, so they don't exist in Kubernetes database. Uh, Kubernetes just identifies them by a string ID. Um, so uh, when you send a uh, API request to Kubernetes API, uh, first of all, Kubernetes uh, authenticates the request uh, and uh, identifies which user uh, is sending that request, uh, what groups it belong, uh, that user belongs to, and uh, uh, it also can uh, extract uh, a map of extra information uh, depending on uh, authentication method used. Uh, 
another uh, attribute Kubernetes uh, API server adds to the request for uh, access control framework to work on is uh, whether uh, is, is a flag essentially talking whether it's an a resource flag uh, resource uh, request or non resource request so essentially in addition to resources uh, or objects with which you can operate uh, under uh, api under kubernetes api you can also send requests to uh, non resource api endpoints like version for example uh, or uh, list of apis available meta, meta information uh, kubernetes server uh, Kubernetes API server provides. So then for API resource requests, uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, decodes essentially API request verb, uh, namespace, if it's a namespace resource, uh, API group, resource name, and uh, if, if, if available, a sub resource identification. For non-resource request, uh, this set of attributes is smaller, uh, it's just an HTTP request verb and request path. So those attributes are available to access control framework to analyze and uh, provide decision on whether uh, it's um, uh, uh, this request will be allowed or not. Uh, and as I said, uh, there are a number of, uh, so with non-resource request, HTTP request verb is, is, is pretty obvious. Uh, for resource request, this verb gets mapped onto an API resource. Uh, action uh, and most common are well get list create update uh, delete uh, but there are some less common uh, things like watch patch uh, bind escalate use uh, so we, we won't stop uh, on, on those in, in much detail in this presentation uh, so uh, for the next few slides i'm going to talk about different uh, ways uh, uh, you can authenticate with Kubernetes to identify who you are. Uh, but before going there, just a, a, a mention of uh, uh, tools that can be used uh, when you learn um, this for yourself or, or analyze or trying to debug uh, how, 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 how your application connects to Kubernetes API. So curl is always great to for experiments and as, as Kubernetes API is standard REST API, curl works perfect with, with it. A kubectl, of course, uh, Kubernetes uh, command line tool, uh, command line utility. Uh, and I uh, want to mention JQ uh, is a command line tool that helps visualize uh, JSON and uh, we will work a lot with JSON and YAML if you work with Kubernetes and Kubernetes API. And here is just an example of how uh, uh, different clients can be used with uh, uh, Kubernetes. So I have uh, here uh, a console already configured to work with kubectl and uh, uh, it has a number of uh, uh, various secrets uh, set in, in, in different environment variables. So I can demo uh, different commands. So the simplest command you can issue against Kubernetes API, kubectl get nodes. Uh, uh, kubectl shows you uh, the list of nodes you have in the cluster. Uh, very convenient uh, uh, switch that you can use with kubectl is verbosity, uh, setting up to eight. You will be able to see which HTTP request kubectl sends, and it's very useful for uh, debugging. And if you uh, up it to Verbosity 9, uh, uh, kubectl will just show you a curl command that you should issue to repeat that request. And here's an example of how uh, this works with curl. So I have, uh, it's exactly the same command, uh, listing uh, nodes in Kubernetes API. <clears throat> I'm just sending it through JQ and uh, less to have a colored uh, convenient output. So you see uh, uh, what Kubernetes uh, API server gives you back in response to the list of nodes. Okay, going back to our presentation. Um, 
there are a number of authentication mechanisms available to clients, uh, uh, starting from client certificates, bearer, bearer tokens, uh, uh, HTTP basic OS, OS is an option. Uh, and then there are two more, which I will talk about, uh, authentication proxy and impersonation. Uh, which is sort of not a uh, impersonation is not a way to authenticate yourself, but uh, a way to use already authenticated connection to pose yourself as someone else, uh, which can also be useful for debugging or in some real life use cases. So uh, when we are talking about client certificates, uh, we'll talk about two different ways of signing those certificates. You can either uh, have uh, an enterprise certificate authority uh, or PKI uh, infrastructure, uh, in which case uh, you may use that external infrastructure to sign uh, client certificates uh, so that they can be used to authenticate this cluster. Or uh, an easier way that does not require uh, uh, this external infrastructure, but may not be suitable for large scale uh, use uh, is through Kubernetes itself. Kubernetes can sign those client certificates by itself. Uh, with bearer token, we, we have a number of uh, ways to get that token. So there is a so-called bootstrap token capability, node authentication token. We'll not talk about them uh, because they are mostly used for internally in Kubernetes for Kubernetes initialization and bootstrapping. <coughs> Uh, it's possible to use static token file, which we won't talk about again because it's considered a bad practice and secure way of uh, providing tokens. And then two ways of getting tokens uh, from service accounts and OIDC. Uh, uh, so we'll, 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 we'll talk about today uh, because they are practically useful. HTTP basic auth, uh, again, considered and secure. Uh, uh, can only be done through static password file uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, I want to mention about uh, mention it, but won't talk about that much. And then two other uh, options, authentication proxy and impersonation. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. So starting with client certificate. Uh, so uh, the process uh, with client certificate uh, with externally signed certificate looks as follows. So client needs to get uh, a client certificate, which uh, he, uh, client can provide to Kubernetes API uh, together with, uh, not, not to get, but uh, client will have some private key. Uh, that certificate uh, will be paired with that private key. So this private key and certificate will be used to establish and authenticate connection against Kubernetes API. So client uses this private key to create a client uh, certificate si signing request, which client sends to administrator or to or uses a PKI, uh, enterprise PKI to uh, get back a, 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 an actual signed certificate. So that signed certificate needs to be signed using uh, Kubernetes um, uh, certificate authority private key or key uh, which is trusted by uh, um, uh, Kubernetes API server. So it needs to be uh, set uh, as a parameter of the API server. Um, so downside of this approach is that uh, that private key now uh, essentially has to be uh, exposed uh, to some outside actor. Uh, so, and if it's an enterprise PKI, it's acceptable. Uh, uh, if it's a manual uh, certificate signature, it's, it's probably not what you want to do. Still, we'll uh, walk through the process. And uh, um, a side note, so I tried to make this presentation as practically use, useful as possible. So in a few slides, you'll, you, you'll see uh, a set of uh, command line commands that you can use to uh, to, to try it, to experiment with that. So uh, this slide shows uh, essentially a sequence uh, of signing certificate and using that certificate, uh, certificate uh, um, that we will, we will try right now. So uh, we'll start from scratch. So I, as a client, uh, create my, my own uh, private key. 
and using that private key, I am signing a uh, CSR, a certificate signature request. Note that in that certificate, I use a common name uh, and uh, organizations. So uh, Kubernetes will essentially map the common name into user and uh, organizations into groups. So if this certificate uh, request is signed, so that client um, uh, certificate will be identified by Kubernetes as a user one who belongs to two groups, group one and group two. And now uh, I, as an administrator who has just received this uh, certificate request, can sign it using a uh, cluster uh, CA key, uh, certificate authority key and certificate authority uh, uh, certificate. Okay, so the certificate is signed now. I have my certificate and my user key, and I can use them to send a request to my Kubernetes cluster. So I can just pass them as a command line option to kubectl. Uh, I can do that, and you see the result is that, well, Kubernetes identified us as a user one, uh, but because as a user one, we don't uh, yet have any permissions within the cluster, uh, we are not allowed to do anything. So just to make things interesting, I'll uh, go to uh, that cluster and uh, give me permission. And uh, so this is a user interface uh, uh, of Kubler I'm using just to make it easier for me to manage uh, uh, roles and role bindings. And I'll talk about roles and role bindings a little bit later. <clears throat> So for now, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to create a new role binding, uh, which uh, gives uh, user one a cluster admin role. And I'll talk about what cluster admin role is uh, in a little bit. Uh, so for now, it's just enough to know that user uh, cluster admin is uh, someone who can do anything within the cluster. So we are saving the role binding. Now user one is associated with uh, cluster admin. Let's see if it helps to fix our issue. Yes, now the same comment with this certificate uh, returns the results. So we can see the nodes. Uh, another way of using uh, client certificate authentication is uh, to get client certificate from uh, the cluster itself. So how it works, uh, again, I as a client create a certificate signature request, but this time admin administrator or uh, external system doesn't sign it. Uh, instead, uh, they send it, apologies. Uh, they send it to Kubernetes cluster itself. And Kubernetes cluster has a process that signs that certificate uh, and issues that certificate so that administrator can extract it from Kubernetes API and send it back to the client. The client will use it. So the process is like that. So for this, we uh, use a, a special object called certificate signing request in Kubernetes API. So let's try and uh, run through the process here. Uh, again, we are generating another private key and we are generating another uh, uh, certificate signing request. This time uh, it's for user two who belongs to group three. <clears throat> Now, as an administrator, instead of signing this uh, certificate directly, I am sending a uh, uh, request to API server asking to create certificate signing request. Let's do that. And server uh, obliges. Uh, the certificate signing request is created. We can check. Um, can check those uh, which requests are there and in what state they are. 
here it is our user to request is in pending state so now as an administrator maybe another administrator uh, i can approve it or i had an option to deny it actually so now i approved it and uh, let's check its status so the condition briefly becomes approved and then based on that kubernetes uh, issues uh, a certificate and condition becomes approved issue so now uh, if uh, now I can extract uh, and we can actually quickly check how this certificate looks uh, if we ask Kubernetes to show it uh, in YAML format let's see so you see uh, this is our object uh, which has uh, a request inside by 64 encoded request and in the status section it has actual issued certificate uh, in also base 64 encoded so i can use uh, this command uh, to extract it into a file and again this is part of the presentation and now i can use this file to try to authenticate in the kubernetes cluster and you can see again i am authenticated as user 2 i'm just not allowed Oh, like, are you still there? I think your audio might have cut out. Oh, like, are you still there? Yes, sure. OK, now we can hear you. We lost you for a second there. <laughs> OK, I, I apologize for those technical no issues. No problem. Uh, no, no, not sure if it's on my side or it's internet. But OK, uh, just let me know if, if there is anything like that again. Um, well, so yeah. Pardon? Oh, I'll let you know if there's anything else, but I can hear you great and I can see your slides. You're doing great. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Uh, using tokens. And uh, the, the easiest way to get a new token is essentially to create a service account in the Kubernetes uh, API. And uh, Kubernetes server will automatically issue a token associated with that uh, service account and will identify then anyone who uses that token as uh, using that service account uh, to access cluster so and uh, a comment uh, creating a service account is uh, as you can imagine very simple kubecat will create service account and then the name so i have just created it uh, uh, let's check Uh, now you see uh, when I'm checking which service account I have right now, I see my service account I have just created and a default service account. So default service account uh, is, always, is always created in every namespace you create in Kubernetes. And that's a default service account associated with uh, pods usually that run in that namespace. Uh, now, um, as we look at those service accounts uh, I can, we can check what's inside and we will see that a service account object has a link to a or reference to a secret object and uh, that secret object is actually the one that holds uh, the token So here it is, here is that secret, uh, secret object. And if I want to look inside of that secret object, uh, here is the token as a part of that object structure. So I'll use uh, a bit of uh, bash scripting to extract uh, that secret token uh, um, secret name and uh, the token itself into an environment variable and now uh, I have that secret token in, uh, in, a, in SA token environment variable I can use it again either uh, providing that token through kubectl command line um, 
and we see already familiar uh, response that yes you are authenticated and identified as a uh, service account in default space uh, in default namespace with name as a1 uh, but you are not allowed to to get those nodes um, uh, I also need to mention that uh, to work with cube cattle, uh, you often, uh, or in most cases, you will uh, specify these secrets uh, and credentials, uh, not via uh, command line, but via uh, cube cattle configuration file. And uh, you can modify that configuration file uh, using cube cattle commands itself. So I can put that token into my uh, cube config file uh, as another set, as an additional set of credentials. Um, I can create uh, a context that uses these credentials and with uh, the cluster I am currently working with. And then uh, I can switch context to use these credentials. And uh, now I can just run cube cattle uh, without specifying um, any secret information in the command line, but relying on the current context set uh, within that config file. So you see now uh, I'm again, uh, I'm using the same token authentication, but this time the token is taken from the um, uh, from uh, from the config file. So you can always, uh, again, operate with your config file using various uh, command line option. Uh, so uh, for example, I can see the list of contexts available uh, in my config file. Let me switch back to my uh, admin, uh, uh, admin uh, account who has all permissions in, in the cluster. So all these commands are mentioned here in the slide, so you can experiment with them uh, uh, on your own time and on your own schedule. Uh, the last way of authenticating through tokens is actually using an external identity provider, or ADC, uh, uh, or else identity provider. And in, in our case, I will use um, uh, an uh, key clock identity provider, which, which comes uh, as a part of Kubler. So uh, key clock is great in, in, in that um, you can create uh, so-called realms there. Uh, and realm is essentially a completely separate domain for your users, groups, uh, authentications, federations, et cetera, et cetera. So key clock, key clock is a very flexible um, uh, identity broker, which can uh, provide, uh, which is compatible with SAML or ADC. Uh, allows you to manage users uh, internally as a part uh, of the clock itself. So it is uh, both an identity provider uh, as well as it can, uh, can work as an identity broker. So for this demo, what I, what I did, I created a uh, uh, demo app realm. Uh, oh, apologies, <clears throat> let me log in again. Be simple. So I created a demo app realm. Uh, I created a so-called client. So client is essentially a, a, a configuration object that allows uh, certain identity uh, provider clients to connect using a certain uh, protocol. So it can be a SAML client, or in our case, I created a client called Kubernetes, which is configured to provide uh, OIDC uh, endpoint, uh, authentication endpoint. And uh, it's very flexible. Again, you can configure uh, which attributes will be uh, placed uh, into tokens issued by this client, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I also created uh, a, a test user called DA admin and uh, put it into a group. I also created and named the admins. So um, how uh, authentication uh, with OIDC works? So first of all, your Kubernetes API server needs to be configured to talk 
with an uh, OIDC endpoint with OIDC provider. So, and uh, in our case, so I essentially just uh, changed uh, through, through, through configuration of uh, my cluster created in Kubler. I provided those parameters as a part of the uh, cluster specification. So they were added to uh, uh, API server uh, uh, sta 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 startup options. Uh, now, uh, when client wants to connect to a Kubernetes API, uh, client actually talks to identity provider and uses one of the flows uh, defined in OIDC to get an uh, authentication access and refresh token. So identity provider gives tokens back, back and now client can use that token to authenticate with Kubernetes API. And Kubernetes API server can talk uh, uh, through back channel with uh, OIDC identity provider to verify that token or that token may be uh, some J -J -J -W, JWT token, which, which can be verified by, uh, by the API offline. Uh, in any case, so that token uh, uh, provides all required information to Kubernetes API server uh, saying who this client is. And client also can uh, refresh that token using a refresh token. So let's see how it looks in a uh, common line world. <clears throat> so uh, we'll just use curl uh, to talk to identity provider on the client side, although uh, again, uh, IDP uh, uh, specific tools may be used uh, in real life. And uh, the first thing you can do is to actually log in. So uh, sending this command to API server. We get a request, uh, which as you can see includes access token, refresh token, and ID token. ID token and refresh token can be used to uh, refresh the access token. So access token is usually very short lived, in this case five minutes, refresh token uh, is uh, has longer uh, lifetime. In this case, it's half an hour. And uh, I'll use a little bit again of scripting to send uh, to, to, to run the same command uh, so that uh, it so that it saves uh, uh, those tokens in, 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 in three environment variables and prints them. So here they are. And now uh, uh, as I have those tokens, uh, I can um, let's see how how refresh works essentially. So uh, I can refresh uh, the token through command line, um, sending ID and uh, sending ID token and. Uh, uh, refresh token to the identity provider. So I will get a refreshed set of tokens, which doesn't mean that my previous ones uh, stopped working. Uh, that may depend on the identity provider uh, configuration. Uh, I can also use uh, an identity provider endpoint to introspect token. So this is essentially an API that uh, Kubernetes API server can use to check who uh, sends a request to you. So, and here, uh, uh, this is a typical uh, introspection response. Uh, so identity provider tells us that this token belongs to a user with the admin name uh, who, who is part of the admin group. So uh, we also have these comments in the presentation. <clears throat> and uh, let's see how uh, those tokens can be used to uh, set up a, a cube cuttle to work with the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, you cannot uh, this time uh, um, 
use uh, so refresh tokens, for example, using kubectl command line, but uh, you can put those tokens into a cube config file uh, using uh, this command, again, part of the presentation. And uh, uh, this uh, makes it possible. So let's switch the context. Um, so now we are setting our kube config file to use this context with OIDC token. So, and now as we uh, work with um, kubectl, so kubectl will use uh, these tokens and will automatically refresh uh, access token when it expires um, uh, as long as refresh token is uh, active. So in, th in this case, you see uh, I'm trying to get nodes and now I again correctly identify it as a, a ADA admin user uh, registered in uh, this OIDC provider. So now user identity is a little bit longer. Uh, remember, it's not an object in API server, it's just a string. Uh, and uh, the only problem is that this user doesn't yet have any permissions in, in our cluster. Okay, so uh, we talked about uh, um, probably uh, the last uh, client uh, useful way of authenticating in a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, two more ways uh, to provide access to Kubernetes uh, cluster is using AUS proxy. So in this case, uh, so it's, it's mainly used by vendors setting up uh, different uh, Kubernetes architectures. So, and, and uh, this uh, means that you would start an uh, proxy server essentially that proxies all requests to Kubernetes API and you would establish a trusted relation between uh, Kubernetes API and that proxy. So uh, proxy can authenticate users uh, and clients any way it, it likes, it wishes. Um, uh, and uh, it will uh, put uh, user identification into the request headers uh, for those requests that are sent to Kubernetes API. And uh, this way, so Kubernetes API will know uh, who uh, they work with. So in Kubler, for example, this uh, authentication method is used to proxy, uh, uh, for example, dashboard requests uh, or uh, uh, web console requests. And again, I'm uh, out of my session scope. Let me log in again. Uh, so uh, web console requests, uh, um, and in general provide a proxy Kubernetes API endpoint. So, but in most cases it's used by vendors. <clears throat> and another way of authenticating uh, within a Kubernetes cluster is uh, impersonation. So if you already have uh, uh, certain credentials uh, and uh, uh, that, that are allowed to access Kubernetes API and uh, using authorization uh, rules, uh, those credentials are permitted to impersonate users, and we'll talk about uh, those permissions in a little bit. Uh, you can uh, essentially send uh, impersonation headers and uh, Kubernetes API will switch your uh, authentication context to uh, that impersonated user. From command line perspective, uh, this looks uh, as follows. So let's, let's get back to our um, uh, admin context. <clears throat> Just a second. Um, we'll use context AWS demo. So now uh, I as an admin can send request for list of nodes. But I as an admin can send also the same request uh, with a set of impersonation headers. 
So in this case, for example, uh, I am specifying that I want to impersonate myself as a service account SA1, which in addition belongs to two groups. And now I get an expected response that even though as an admin, I am allowed to make that request, uh, then uh, impersonating that service account, I'm not allowed to, to, to retrieve the list of nodes. Okay, so that covers uh, most important uh, methods of authentication. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, we are short on time. So I'll, I'll briefly go through uh, authorization mechanisms and uh, uh, we'll uh, talk about only two of them uh, in a little bit more details, it's Airbag and Webhook. So there are ways to authenticate using uh, node, uh, authorize using uh, node authorization, uh, ABAC authorization, and then there are two more uh, authorization plugins in Kubernetes called always deny and always allow. So node, again, it's mainly used uh, internally for kubelets to uh, uh, um, ABAC is based on a static file and is considered insecure and deprecated uh, and always deny and always allow uh, based on their name you can figure out that those are mainly good for testing. Um, now uh, we'll talk about uh, first uh, about webhook mechanism. Uh, so essentially through uh, uh, an additional uh, option on Kubernetes API server, you can provide external authorization server service uh, to which Kubernetes API will call when it needs to decide uh, whether a request needs to be allowed or not. So, and uh, API for that authorization server service is uh, well documented in Kubernetes documentation. Uh, moreover, Kubernetes API itself uh, provides this API, so and uh, extension servers uh, use that mechanism uh, uh, when uh, uh, they uh, provide decisions on authorization on uh, extension objects in, in Kubernetes API. So from practical standpoint, the most useful way of authorization is RBAC. So RBAC is based on uh, declarative uh, definitions uh, of permissions. Uh, uh, based on cluster, again, uh, API objects. And the main ones uh, of those objects are roles and cluster roles. So role and cluster role both represent a set of uh, uh, permissions on certain objects in the API, identified by API groups and resource names. Uh, and verbs, actions on those objects. So, so you can have uh, a number of rules like that uh, within a role or cluster role object. Now the difference between role and cluster role is that role is namespaced object while, while cluster role is global spaced object. So role always exists in a certain namespace and can only refer to namespaced resources <coughs> uh, and only defines permission to objects within that namespace. Cluster role on, on, another hand, uh, on the other hand is a global object. It, it is not namespaced. It, 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 you are allowed to use it to provide uh, access to uh, global objects, non-namespaced objects. And also you can use it to provide uh, access to, uh, to non-resource uh, URLs. So essentially to things like API versions, LZ endpoints on, on, on API server. Uh, one thing that you need to know about cluster role is that you also can use uh, a property called aggregation. So while roles do not support that, cluster roles can be aggregated, in which case uh, you just specify an aggregation rule uh, for your cluster role, uh, which is essentially a set of label matching rules and uh, Kubernetes will find all cluster roles that match that label and aggregate them into this cluster role dynamically. So you can add and remove uh, matching cluster roles um, uh, and uh, aggregated cluster role will change the set of permissions accordingly. So this is uh, very useful for predefined cluster roles I'll talk about in a second. 
uh, you associate cluster roles, permissions with uh, actors, service accounts, users, groups through role bindings and cluster role bindings. And uh, they have similar correspondence. R role binding is always created in a specific namespace and role binding uh, can be associated with either role or cluster role. If it's associated with role, clearly uh, it allows certain actor uh, permissions uh, specified in that role to objects within that namespace. If it's associated with a cluster role, uh, it permits access to namespaced objects defined in that cluster role only within that namespace. So it's very convenient when, uh, so we'll talk about that when we talk about predefined roles. Cluster role binding, uh, as you can derive from the name, is a global object. So it, it, it associates cluster role with users, groups, service accounts. It cannot be associated with a namespaced role. So it is used to provide access to global uh, objects, non-namespaced objects, or to, to namespaced objects in all namespaces. So, and uh, every Kubernetes cluster comes with three roles, cluster roles defined uh, by default out of the box. One is cluster admin uh, used to, uh, to, to provide access to everything in the cluster. So uh, an, an account that is associated with cluster admin uh, can have access to everything, which, 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 which sort of matches the name. Uh, admin role is intended to uh, define uh, namespace admins. So admin provides full access to namespaced objects within a specific namespace. Uh, uh, edit role is uh, sort of same as admin, except it does not grant you uh, uh, rights to uh, change uh, um, access control and permission objects. So you can do anything within namespace except for uh, uh, granting access to other users. And then view role is essentially read-only access to namespace objects within a specific namespace. So uh, uh, just a quick overview of how you can start uh, and make uh, sense of uh, the system. Uh, the easiest way to do that is, is to just start with built-in role. So those four roles is, is quite enough to, 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 to provide some basic use cases. Uh, um, your operations team may have a cluster admin role associated. Uh, if you want to give a certain team access to a namespace, give them a namespace admin role and developers may have uh, uh, edit role, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So new roles, uh, you will define them as needed uh, based on your specific use cases and uh, base, based on how you want to work around several uh, gotchas, so to say. And this slide is dedicated to them. So for example, you need to be aware of a problem called privilege escalation via pod creation. So if a person uh, can start a pod in a namespace, uh, through that pod, uh, they have essentially access to uh, uh, secret objects within that namespace. So for example, it doesn't make sense to allow someone to start a pod, but not allow them to read uh, secrets in that uh, namespace because uh, people can just map that secret into that pod and extract information over there. So it's something that needs to be, uh, that, that, that you need to be aware of, about. Um, another uh, thing to remember is that non-namespaced objects can be of potential interest to developers as well. So uh, for example, things like CRD, priority classes, pod security policies may, be, uh, may have to be created when you deploy certain frameworks. So um, for example, service meshes, et cetera. So uh, if uh, developers uh, need some level of freedom to uh, experiment with different frameworks, they will most probably have to uh, be allowed to manage at least some of the non-namespaced objects. And uh, in many cases, it's just easier to uh, provide them a separate set of clusters 
or a space where they can create clusters to experiment them to manage uh, those non-namespaced objects one by one in a single uh, critical cluster. Um, and uh, one more thing that needs to be thought from the beginning is uh, role and role binding name conventions uh, in the sense uh, that uh, you need to decide how you will name those role bindings and roles if you create new ones. Uh, how you create them, for example, whether you create uh, one role binding per subject or you will manage uh, role bindings with multiple subjects, uh, whether it's one per role, uh, whether you are using a mixed approach. Okay, so we are uh, close to wrapping it up. Uh, I just want to mention a few things that uh, we didn't talk about, but that are worth looking at when you are thinking about security, role-based access control and permissions. And those include pod security policies, network policies, limits and quotas, admission controllers, and dynamic admission control things like OPA. So uh, all that uh, allows you to further expand and extend what you can do uh, with access control and security and Kubernetes cluster. So Kubernetes is an incredibly flexible and extensible framework. I uh, summarized uh, objects uh, that you need to be aware of when you are talking about uh, access control and uh, role-based access control in Kubernetes. So you can look them up in Kubernetes documentation <clears throat> and put uh, several references that are a good starting point for experimenting and learning the subject. So having said that, I think we are open to questions. And uh, Christy, what do you think I, I, I can start with uh, the questions that we have in the question? Yeah, we're, yeah we're, unfortunately, we're actually out of time for the day. Uh, um, oh, like, is that okay if people connect with you on Twitter? I see your handle at the bottom of your slides. Absolutely, yes. Um, and I apologize. So it's, it took a little bit longer than I thought. <laughs> no, no problem at all. It was super interesting. Well, anyway, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Oleg, for a great presentation today. Um, as a reminder, the uh, slides and recording will be available um, on the CNCF website later today. Um, and we hope to see you at an upcoming CNCF webinar. Thanks again and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.